in student presentation session. Uh, we can start recording as soon as you're ready. And then uh, Hardik, we'll pass it on to you and allow you to share your slides and everything like that. Adele, can you, I guess if I'm the co-host, I might be able to. Yeah, you're recording. There we go. Okay. Wonderful. Now, are you able to make it so that Hardik can, uh, or Hardik, you should be able to share you your should be uh, able to share slides, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's got his video off, so. Uh, actually, I don't have the permission to start my video, I guess. Um, well, your video is on. There you go, screen sharing. Oh, here we there go. you go. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Excellent. So I will uh, leave the floor to you and you can start telling us about uh, your estimating delta V from car crash images. Hi everyone. My name is Hartik Manekha and I'm uh, doing my research on estimating delta V from car crash images uh, along with my supervisor, Dr. Daniel Silva. And we are working with Acadia Institute of Data Analytics. Ardeek, can you please put your uh, audio up a little bit or get closer to your microphone? Okay. There, that. Oh, yeah. Is it uh, okay now? Yes, that's better. Okay. Uh, sorry. Sorry for that. So our topic is estimating Delta V from car crash images. Uh, and I'm working along with Dr. Daniel Silva uh, for Arcadia Institute of Data Analytics. Basically, a delta V is the difference between the post-collision velocity and pre-collision velocity. Uh, and if we see from the figure one, uh, it showcases like a vehicle one is uh, following some trajectory and vehicle two is uh, about to crash with vehicle one. And uh, when we see the bubble, uh, they crash at that bubble. And after crashing, uh, they do not stop immediately. And they follow for a trajectory after collision and uh, they have some post collision velocity. So basically uh, the equation is like Delta V1 is equal to V1 complement minus V1. And for vehicle two, it would be Delta V2 uh, is equal to V2 complement minus V2. Uh, so calculation of Delta V is basically uh, uh, conducted using a uh, law of conservation of momentum, which says that energy is just conserved before the collision and is transformed in different form after the collision. So if we consider two vehicles uh, with a velocity of vehicle one, say 20 km per hour, and vehicle two is 40 km per hour. And uh, if we use the equation of uh, conservation of momentum and uh, just to substitute those values, the, the post collision velocity that we get is 30 km per hour. Uh, and uh, after that, we can substitute that post collision velocity in the delta V equation. Uh, so delta V1 uh, is equal to delta V complement minus V1. So uh, we got the post collision velocity as 30. So it's 30 minus uh, subtracted from uh, V1, which is 20, is 10 km per hour. So for vehicle V2, we would get the same magnitude, but uh, it would be like, it's a vector, right? So uh, there would be change in the sign. So it would be minus 10 kilometer per hour. So this is like theoretical approach using law of conservation of momentum. But uh, uh, like big organization like NHTSA have been using bin smash software. Uh, which is a simulation software and crush measurements. So crush measurements are basically after the accident, they use the rods to measure how, how, how much is the deformation. Uh, so using that deformation, they calculate the Delta V. Uh, so why the calculation of Delta V is important? Basically, uh, the, it can be used in insurance industry where uh, uh, there are fraudulent claims of billions of dollars each year. And then the, those Delta V's calculated using machine learning can be used uh, to settle the claims uh, using litigation. And along with that, uh, the AI enabled uh, injury analysis can be done uh, using the concept of biomechanics. And uh, research has proved that Delta V is the single best predictor for the injury severity. Uh, so after the literature survey, we actually got the probability of fatalities, which is uh, equal to the Delta V divided by 69.2, which is a constant raised to 4.57. Similarly, uh, we also have the probability of injuries, uh, which is equal to Delta V uh, divided by one constant. And this is a fixed constant, which is 67.4. Uh, 
uh, raised to 2.62. Uh, so machine learning, uh, I mean, they have also used machine learning uh, for, as a calculation of delta V, uh, such that quadratic logistic regression is used to calculate the probability of injury. Uh, and it can be uh, given as uh, uh, the logarithmic uh, of probability is equal to uh, B0, uh, B1, B2, which are just the unknown parameters. And DI is the delta V of vehicle. Ith uh, vehicle and d bar uh, is the uh, sample mean delta v. Uh, we can also use the linear approximation of that same quadratic model. Uh, so basically, for the we have unadjusted model and adjusted model. If there are three predictors, the three predictors can be child's age, the restraint type. So basically, whether the belt, uh, the child was belt, uh, used the seat belt or uh, it didn't, uh, the child didn't use the seat belt. And uh, the seating row, whether the child was sitting in the front uh, seat or uh, whether it, or he was sitting in the rear seat. Uh, so these were the traditional methods uh, uh, which we caught you know, by the research by the literature review. Uh, but uh, as such, there has been uh, no use of computer vision or uh, uh, like any machine uh, neural networks per se for prediction of Delta V. So we wanted to solve uh, this prediction of Delta V using computer vision and uh, neural networks. Uh, so there wasn't any proof that it can be solved. Hence, we started our experiments using the rigs of rod simulator. So basically it's a soft engine simulator which can be used to simulate uh, accidents. And uh, we got uh, this kind of images after the simulation. So basically if we see the first image uh, is of 12 km per hour. The second image is 55 and third image is 80. Obviously the deformation goes uh, on to a certain extent becomes severe as the velocity is increased. Uh, so after using those images, we got the mean absolute error of 3.77 km per hour. And if we see the graph of actual versus predicted, uh, it's quite, uh, I would say uh, the fit is quite good. Uh, we can say the average prediction, the values uh, in the center are a bit off. Uh, otherwise, uh, the low, uh, low velocity values and high velocity values are a bit accurate. Similarly, uh, we used another simulation. We used another make. Uh, like a Ford car. Uh, this was the Honda car, which is a bit compact car, Honda Accord. And this is a Ford car, which is a type of SUV. So we wanted to test the, the type, how the vehicle model, like uh, the hatchback and the SUV impact the prediction of Delta V. So after that, after using this uh, model, uh, we got the mean absolute error of 7.8 km per hour. And uh, if we again see the actual versus predicted graph, uh, the graph, uh, the predict the model is not quite a good fit, uh, not a quite a good fit, as compared to this one, the red Honda model. Uh, as we see, uh, the difference is quite large, uh, in this, uh, I, I would say mid velocity, and also in the low velocity uh, images. So we used Honda model, uh, the first model, that is this one, which had the mean absolute error of 3.77 kilometer on, on the Ford images. So, I mean, after using that Honda model on Ford image with the headlight, we got the mean absolute error of 21.73 kilometer per hour, which is huge. And after that, we tried to convert the Ford model to look like the Honda images. Uh, because if we see in this Ford model, the first picture, the headlight is very flashy. But if we see the for Honda model, we cannot see the headlight, uh, which is like very bright. So it is present in Ford, but not in Honda. So we tried to Photoshop it. And uh, if we see in the second picture, the MA is reduced to 16.91. And then we also tried to Photoshop the color. So we could change the color from gray to red, exactly what the Honda color has. And yeah, the results improved. It was 16.72. To again test the change of color of a model, we photoshopped the red Honda model to the green and then the same red to the blue. Uh, 
and there was difference in the color so using the again original red honda model we tested on the green honda so it was like five point the results were 5.3 kilometer per hour and for the blue honda it was 4.92 kilometer per hour so after the after concluding this two experiments uh, we inferred that uh, yeah the size of the car uh, that is like uh, whether the car is an suv or a compact car it impacts the prediction result and likewise the color of the car also impacts the uh, prediction result so we then uh, thought to change the uh, brg uh, like rgb scale into grayscale model and uh, we just used the grayscale images so the result were uh, improved and we got the ma of 3.41 as compared to the original 3.77 km per hour so it was improved by 0.3 and uh, after that uh, we got the same we used those grayscale model for the four images and uh, the ma was 18.89 if we see it was uh, for with headlight when we used honda images for four it was 21.73 but it improved for grayscale model and it decreased to 18.89 similarly for without the headlight it decreased to 17.88 after that uh, we used uh, grayscale images of ford model uh, and uh, it was uh, the ma is 4.95 uh, as compared to the original color images where the ma was 7.80 km per hour so again there was improvement uh, in the mean absolute score after considering the grayscale images after that we combined the data set uh, we combined the uh, first we uh, Uh, did the experiment on the combined color images so the ma was 3.94 where we combined the honda and ford images uh, as the data set and uh, similarly we also did the grayscale test uh, with the combined data set and then the ma is decreased to 3.63 km per hour so uh, this was the simulation experiments that we did and uh, because we had the uh, environment under our control we can uh, we used we can control the collision type like how, what would be the collision type so we wanted the front collision the impact should be on the front part so we did the front collisions but uh, for the real images we used the data set provided by the national highway traffic safety administration uh they provide the crash investigation data and we used those images uh and we selected uh, the front crash images because we already have the benchmark results uh which we did using the simulation software so we can compare those results the like the real crash images with the simulation images after using the real crash images uh, the mean absolute error that we caught is 3.36 km per hour so the next steps uh, would be like scaling performing scaling normalization currently we are not performing any scaling so if we see uh, there is some distance and the distance is varied between the camera and the car so we want that a distance to be eliminated so that it doesn't play any role in the prediction of delta v and we also want to handle different types of collisions uh, like the front along with front collisions we want to handle the side collisions and the rear end collisions uh, that's it from my side thank you any questions thank you very very much uh, so what we're actually going to do we're going to do all of the questions at the end if that's all right so we're going to keep track of all the questions um and then after we've had all the presentations we'll do the questions all at once um, sure So we will we'll give you a chance to reshare your screen in case any of the slides end up being uh, useful for it. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. So we were able uh thank thank you very much for your presentation though. That was excellent. No problem. Uh, and we were able to get uh, HM Mahadi back. Uh, he's able to connect to the thing. So we will have our next presentation from HM Mahadi uh coming up right now. So let's make sure you can share your screen here. Um, Hedy, are you able to? Are you there? 
Uh, yeah, I'm here. Wonderful. I'm going to share my screen if that's all right. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. Your your microphone is a little bit low, uh, so if there's an easy way to, to turn it up, that's probably a... Okay, uh, is it clear now? Oh, that's a little bit more clear. Okay, uh, so first of all, my apologies. I missed just the time. It's quite so I, Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I am H.M. Madison, so I'm going to uh, present today uh, analysis of model aggregation technique in inferred learning. I'm from University of Regina. My supervisor is Dr. Jing Tao Yao. So uh, in today's uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about what is fair learning, main objectives of fair learning, and where and how can we use FL, fair learning. And uh, the main contribution of my research is model aggregation in fair learning. And we'll discuss some uh, experiments and uh, other discussions with uh, other papers. So uh, to start uh, fair learning, I'm going to talk about algorithm and machine learning first. Um, so Algorithm is, uh, is a uh, structured program to do a specific task. Uh, for an example, if I want to find a shortest path from one point A to point B, then I use uh, programming or you can uh, say algorithm. So I have the program, uh, written program, I also have the data, which in case would be an array or 2D array to find the shortest path from point, point A to point B. So uh, based on that uh, specific program, I will get an output. Uh, so this is what uh, algorithm is or uh, you know general programming and the next is uh, machine learning but however uh, the difference between uh, algorithm and machine learning is um, in machine learning i have a template so i just uh, uh, you know set the template and uh, i have a training data and uh, i give some instructions to uh, place the data inside the template and give me an output so what it does it will uh, start training with the training data uh, with the template and uh, gives uh, after the training, the model will give an output uh, testing data. So the basic difference is uh, between algorithm and machine learning is uh, the algorithm is uh, structured uh, programming. So it's, 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 it will do a specific task, but machine learning will learn itself to do the same task for, uh, that was given by the user. The next is uh, before going to the fair learning, I want to talk about distributed learning. So fair learning also is a distributed learning. So uh, we'll see the difference between uh, fair learning and distributed learning. However, in distributed learning, uh, let's say I have two clients. Uh, so client A and client B. So I have two data, client A's data and client B's data. Also I have a, another client, client C. So client C says, hey, client A and B, give me your data so that we can, uh, you know, initiate a model and gives the output based on our, your, based on our common scenario. Uh, let's consider that this is uh, University of Queens, this is University of Regina, this is University of Saskatoon. So University of Queens says, hey, give me your data so that we can collaborate with, uh, you know, uh, to do uh, student personalizations. So the data moves from this server, which is a university, and this server, which is another university, goes to the a, another university. So they uh, initialize the model and gives the final model. Then after uh, uh, producing the final model, this model will, goes back to the uh, client A and B, which is the university, or the, uh, in case of, uh, as an example, student uh, personalizations. So you can see that in distributed learning, the data moves from one location to another. And uh, considering today's uh, scenario, this is not so much good because uh, these data are very private. So it uh, costs a uh, privacy uh, risk and also other, uh, uh, other tasks. Um, so before, so the distributed learning is uh, that the data moves from one server to another. Uh, so now, now I want to talk about fair learning. So the main difference is uh, between distributed learning and fair learning is that the client's data stays at the client server. So let's say these are uh, some clients. So client A, client B to client N. And in distributed learning, uh, in fair learning, what uh, there will be a central server also. So central server will send a global model, you know, uh, at the first stage, it would be a dummy model. Uh, so this dummy model will go back and goes to the each client. Then each client use their data and uh, the dummy model sent by a central server will train uh, separately. 
then the, after complete uh, completion of the training, the models will go back to the central server again. Then the model aggregation will happen here in the central server. After model aggregation, the updated model will go back to the central uh, local client again. So I'm calling client A and client B are local clients, and central server is for model aggregation purpose. So if I want to give an example, uh, let's consider uh, Google Keyboard. So what Google does, they actually use fair learning in their uh, uh, Google Keyboard. So Google, Keyboard, Google has a central server, and these clients are the mobile devices. So uh, Google uh, sends the dummy model first to the, all the clients, which is smartphones. Then the local model training will happen in these servers separately. Then these models, the uh, generated model for, from each smartphone, then will go back to the central server. The central server will aggregate all the models together. Then uh, the aggregated models go back to the smartphones again. So I, I use Google Keyboard in my smartphone. I can see the changes uh, after each update so that uh, the, the worst prediction is changing. So based on my users. So I'm using, let's say, some specific sentence each daily day. So after each uh, update, I can see that it improves. It lets me know that, okay, do you want to pick these words uh, after one another? So there's the uses of uh, fair learning. So you can see that the main difference between fair learning and distributed learning is that data never leaves from the client side, only the models goes to the central server. Now, uh, in order to uh, run uh, fair learning, I used a neural network. So neural network is, uh, is also, uh, you can say as a machine learning uh, concept. So in neural network, we have three things, optimizer, loss function, and metrics. So basically, uh, neural network uh, combinations of neurons, uh, you know, input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. So there can be many hidden layers and input layer based on the inputs you're providing to the neural network. And uh, there will be an output layer after some iterations between hidden layers, the model will give and uh, produce an uh, output. So in order to do that, the neural network needs an optimizer, which an algorithm to find the best parameters to fill out the template. And the loss functions, the main objective of the loss functions to minimize the loss. So if the loss is higher, the, the model is not performing well. But if the model is decreasing as the neural network performs or trains uh, each iterations of uh, training data, then we will see that the model, uh, is, uh, model performance is increasing. Also, we can validate these uh, results by using metrics, which is you know, uh, accuracy something like that. So uh, in terms of how neural network works, let's say I have uh, input X and uh, each neural network has a weights and biases. So inputs will go in this input layer and using weights and biases, it will do a calculations and goes to the next neurons. So from this neuron, there will be a calculation, it goes to the next neurons using uh, also here, that it will use the activation function. So activation functions uh, uh, introduce the non-linearity inside a neural network to do the process faster and to make the neural network uh, you know, uh, perform better. So this step uh, goes to the uh, goes forward as it goes to the y hat. Y hat is the model output. So uh, if once we are here, y hat it will calculate the loss functions. So so y hat is the uh, model predicted output and y is the already that we have the output in some terms of uh, the data. So it will compare the predicted output and the outputs that was provided by the user and it will calculate the loss. So if the loss is higher than model didn't perform well, then it will go back from here to back to the input layer. So this is called back propagation and from this point input to the output is called forward propagation. So that's how neural network works. And in terms of my experiment, I used a uh, conversion neural network, which has an input layer and the two hidden layer. Each hidden layer has a relay activation function. Kernel size is five by five, max pull uh, 2D is two by two. And then the output layer, I used a software activation functions and uh, after uh, for feed forward and back propagations, multiple iterations, the model gives out. So the experience setup is uh, I used four clients. So uh, 
since I don't have that massive amount of data, that's why I have to use four clients and a central server. So I separate the data set into each client and the each client will train based on the uh, local data and send the model to the central server. The central server will do model aggregation such as this is the four models from four clients. Then after aggregation four models, there will be one model. And this updated model will go back to the uh, client second. So I did four iterations. So you can see iteration one, two, three, four. After four iteration of parallel learning, I set the benchmark to see how my model is performing in, in, in different scenario. So data set, uh, I used uh, MNIST data set, handwritten digits data set. So for each client, I divide the uh, data in training data, testing data, and validation data. So during training, I use validation data to check the performance. And after a complete of the training, I use the testing data to evaluate the model's performance. So I also use fingerprint data set and also separate uh, divided by divided to each client uh, for in each sections of training data testing data and validation data uh, so model aggregation uh, steps so what kind of model aggregation i used in my research so the first one is all models averaging so after first iteration let's say at the first step center server will send a dummy model the client each client will uh, train on the dummy model tiers four model so model one two three four this model comes to the central server and each model will be aggregated together on and create a upgraded model so in that case i used layer wise model weights and biases averaging so that means each uh, layer of this is hidden layer one this is hidden layer two so each uh, hidden layer one will be aggregated together averaged together and the hidden layer two uh, will be uh, averaged together and produce the hidden layer here and the hidden layer one here and a hidden layer two here and this is the output. So in each time it will come, uh, uh, the models are come, uh, came to the central server, the model aggregation happens based on this equation and upgraded model goes to this uh, local client second. So this uh, process will continue four times uh, until I set the benchmark to uh, check the results. And the next model aggregation phase is, uh, selection is you know technique is one model selection so from four clients i only select one client i wanted to see how one client's uh, you know uh, affects the other client's performance so whichever model has higher model accuracy i send that model to the uh, all the local models uh, in the next time uh, next iterations and the third model aggregation technique is based model averaging so in that case i wanted to see if I drop the uh, bad models from the model aggregation phase, uh, how the local clients model training affects. So in that case, let's say model accuracy is 60, 60%, 65%, 62%, 64%. So we have four models. So in that case, I only took two models, which is has 65% and 64%. So the, I dropped my client one and client three. I consider client two and client four. So because these are the good models among these four, I average them together based on my uh, old model separation technique and do the same process again. So uh, in the experiments, uh, you can see that this is the first iterations of each client performance. Then uh, supposedly some uh, client's performance should be decreased after first model aggregation. So we can see that the model aggregation decreased and because of the influence of some uh, good models uh, the next uh, phase also client is performing uh, really well so this is the four step step one step two step three step four so each step uh, after each step uh, at the fourth step that the initial performance is increased of each client uh, so the client t client three is performance increased client uh, one is pretty much same a client two also increased and the client uh four uh, client four also increased but it shows some deviations uh, so i think that in case of all model averaging is the influence of uh, uh bad models with the good models since i'm averaging all the models together so this is the experiments uh results and Model aggregation technique comparisons uh, in terms of handwritten digits, I we can see that the first model aggregation techniques really perform well, but in some cases, model aggregation techniques two outperform from uh, model aggregations one and three. So this is the handwritten, handwritten digits detection, and I use Fred Adam. 
and this is the 100 detection I used for HGD. So you can see that each model performs separately, uh, model uh, aggregation technique two and three also perform well. And this is the fingerprint recognition. So in that case, uh, model aggregation technique one performs better than the other two. So also I used uh, client's dropout. So client's dropout means uh, in terms of smartphones, uh, uh, you know, smartphones needs to be on idle and charging positions to do, to participate in the FL uh, fair learning uh, scenario. So if uh, while training, if uh, mobiles get interrupted, the client dropped from the train. So you can see that client one and client four dropped. It's a, just a scenario in terms of client drop or scenario. So this is solely based on uh, smartphone devices. So we also did that uh, experiment and we get these results. So uh, we get pretty much similar results also. Uh, using client robots, which is CD. So client one, client two, CD, client three, and client four. So this is the comparison. Uh, I used uh, the comparison between two papers. Uh, in the reference, I uh, mentioned those uh, papers, one and two. So they used uh, fair learning. The paper two used transfer learning and used fair averaging and conversion neural network. So they get this result. Uh, in this paper, I used fair learning and fair dropouts using customized fair uh, averaging technique and I get uh, these results. So this is an improvement of the, the first results, also an improvement of the second paper. However, for client dropouts, it, it, it didn't improve that much, but since we are talking about client dropouts, it's the pretty good results that we have achieved. So in the next step, we will uh, use cluster-based fair learning framework and we, we, we are already working on enhanced model aggregation techniques and we will uh, consider best local model performance, um, local model training and possibly implement in the real world scenario such as uh, you know I give an example of different university courses participating in a distributed learning. So instead of distributed learning we will use fair learning. So this is my reference. Thank you if you have any questions. Thank you very, very much. Uh, so anyone who has any questions, you can post them in the chat there and the, and we'll go over all the questions for all the, uh, all the panelists here, all the presenters. Um, but that was an excellent presentation. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. And now I believe we have our final presentation coming up here. Are you ready? I'm just quickly yeah. getting this. In yeah, here. I'm ready. Wonderful. Oh, uh, can I share my screen? You absolutely can. Okay, just give me a while. Uh, is the screen visible? Yep, fully visible. Okay, uh, I'll start. So, thank you very much. Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the presentation. My name is Aditya. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Indiana University of Bloomington, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about Sabre, which is uh, a sender anonymous messaging system. Uh, and this is joint work with my advisor, Ryan Henry from the University of Calgary uh, and Kyle Storier, who is an undergrad at the University of Calgary. Uh, let's begin. Uh, uh, in Center Anonymous Messaging, one of the most celebrated works is the Repost paper from uh, Oakland 2017. Uh, and uh, the goal of the Repost paper, uh, the goal of Repost and goal of Center Anonymous Messaging is to do something called anonymous broadcasting. So think about a bulletin board and a bulletin board which has different locations where you can write stuff uh, and you have a client who wants to write anonymously at any random location. So this is what sender anonymous messaging achieves. Uh, you, might, you might have already guessed that, um, especially from this image, that, sender, uh, that uh, it has a lot of applications, uh, especially, in the, uh, especially in journalism, for instance, where a whistleblower might want to share some details about uh, something horrible happening uh, to a journalist, uh, for example, some human right violation or something, and would like to present the evidence in such a manner by using one of these systems. So this was uh, uh, one of, one of the, uh, this. This is one of the most celebrated works in this direction. Uh, and uh, uh, this year, uh, by the same authors, another system called Express was built on top of this. Uh, this is built on a repost, but it is, but it has a slightly different model where clients can register with a mailbox, that is think of a journalist registering with a mailbox and shares, this, uh, shares the address of that mailbox in public and any uh, source 
can write uh, the evidence or anything anonymously into that mailbox and no one would know what was written. Uh, no one would know who wrote that and where it was written. Uh, and uh, our uh, contribution is uh, Sabre, which is uh, built on top of both Express and uh, Repost. So this is what my, this presentation will be about. Uh, so let's, let's first look at a toy construction of how these systems work. Uh, so let's think about a, a one dimensional database uh, and think about a client who wants to write just the uh, number one in the LF location of this database. Consider two servers who share the same copy of this database. Uh, and what the client does is that it secret shares the standard basis vector, which is a vector which is uh, zero everywhere, but one at the LF location, the location where we, where we want to write. And this is secret shared as follows by sending a random vector R to server B and R XOR with the standard basis vector to server A. The servers XOR whatever vector they receive from the client uh, into the database. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, in this process, one is written into the desired location. As you might see, there's already a problem with this, that if, if many clients are writing to random locations, there is a huge chance of collision that many clients would write to the same location. The way this is circumvented is by using really large databases and thus reducing the probability of a collision. Now, with large, data, with large databases comes another problem that these vectors that we are sending to server B and server A become very large and the communication cost uh, is, not, uh, is not practical. So that's the main problem that we have. And the way Repos solves it is by using something called distributed point functions. Uh, distributed point functions are these magical cryptographic tools that allow parties to share these standard basis vectors among two uh, among parties by sending them just short keys. So the way it works is that the client just generates these distributed point functions by something called a gen algorithm, uh, and the uh, and the servers who receive DPF zero and DPF one just uh, do another uh, run another algorithm called eval full, and the output of that algorithm is are the shares of the standard basis vector. So they have the property that eval full of DPF zero or XOR with eval full of DPF one is indeed the standard basis vector. So let's, ha let's have a look at uh, how this works. We have a client who generates these DPFs, sends the DPFs to these servers, they evaluate the DPF and then XOR that into the database. Uh, and this seems to have solved all our problems, except that uh, it has not because we could have malicious clients uh, who could send bogus DPF seeds. So these could be just random seeds that evaluate to something completely random. Uh, and thus the entire database gets corrupted. Um, the, way, the way Repost and Express um, prevent these malicious clients from uh, corrupting the database uh, is by having a server-side auditing protocol, where on the server side, they receive these DPFs and they, uh, they, do, some, they do a computation on it uh, and they indeed verify that these are uh, shares of a standard basis vector. What we do uh, in Sabre, which is our contribution, is that we replace the server-side auditing with a zero-knowledge proof. Uh, and uh, this is a zero-knowledge proof which the client submits to the uh, servers along with the DPFs. So, uh, so these are the two building blocks, zero-knowledge proofs and multi-party computation on which our thing is built. So what are zero-knowledge proofs? Zero-knowledge proofs are other magical things in cryptography which allow the prover to prove the knowledge of a statement to the verifier. However, the beauty is that the verifier learns nothing else but the knowledge of the statement. That is, uh, uh, for instance, in this case, the prover just learns that these DPFs are valid DPFs uh, and it learns nothing else about it. Uh, and another thing on which we build our system is called multi-party computation. And MPC uh, is a system where we have N parties with N private inputs uh, and they want to compute a function F among themselves. Uh, and uh, and none of them want to reveal their private inputs. Uh, and there's a notion of key privacy when it comes to multi-party computation, which means that uh, in the process of this multi-party computation, if T parties talk to each other, the privacy would not be broken. At most T parties can talk to each other and privacy would not be broken. It would be broken when the T plus one at party joins in. Um, Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so the way we use multi-party computation 
uh, for zero knowledge proofs is by the so called paradigm called mpc in the head which was uh, which was published in 2007 and the way it works is that the prover wants to prove that the function uh, uh, f uh, uh, outputs are out uh, with these parameters so what the prover does is that prover runs a multi-party computation in their head. So it just simulates a multi-party computation. It's not a real multi-party computation, but he just simulates this multi-party computation in the head. And then it, and the prover commits to it, they, all the conversations that happen in this multi-party computation. That is, the, that is all the messages that were sent from one to two, one to three, and so on and so forth. Then the verifier uh, asks the prover to open two transcripts, uh, say I and J, and once these transcripts are revealed, um, the, the verifier checks that the messages that, uh, that uh, uh, I claims to have sent to J are the messages indeed J cl uh, claims to have received from I. And similarly, the messages that I claims to have received from J are the messages that J sent to I. Now, no, now note that uh, uh, the prover just picks two, the, the verifier picks two uh, transcripts at random. So there is a certain probability of cheating. Uh, and this probability of cheating is reduced by simply repeating this experiment several times. Also note that since the verifier is asking for two transcripts to be revealed, uh, it means that you need at least two privacy for this to work. Uh, we discussed the notion of two privacy a couple of slides back. Now let's come back to Sabre. Uh, and in Sabre, we want to prove that uh, the DPF0 and DPF1 are valid DPF keys. That is, we want to prove that the evaluation of DPF0 and the evaluation of DPF1 are indeed uh, exhorting into a standard basis vector. So the first, the client runs an MPC protocol in, in their head, just like uh, the MPC in the head uh, our paradigm suggests. And all one needs to know about our MPC protocol is that it works in the following manner. We have P2, which sends some randomness uh, to P0 and P1. And, and P0 and P1 do some exchanges with each other and compute the DPF. Another thing to know is that our MPC protocol is actually one private. That is, the privacy would be broken if, it, if even if two of them talk to each other. Then, uh, the, uh, thus, uh, the, we cannot directly use the, uh, the verification process that I described earlier. And that is the reason we introduced the notion of distributed verification. Here we have multiple verifiers, and the multiple verifiers do the verification together. And the DPF would be accepted only if both the verifiers accept the proof. Uh, let's see how it works. Um, and, uh, and let's see the main idea behind it. The main idea is that we repeat this process several times. And in each iteration, we either check that uh, if P2 has fo followed the protocol correctly, that is the randomness sent from P2 to P0 and P1 are indeed the correct randomness that should be sent or that given that randomness is correct, two P0 and P P1 follow the protocol correctly. Uh, and since the, uh, uh, has no, uh, since the verifier has no way, uh, the prover has no way of knowing which one would be checked, the probability of cheating becomes pretty low. So let's see how it works. Uh, we, have some, we have a notion of a Merkle tree, which is a, a short fingerprint which commits, to, which commits the prover to all the messages of all the simulated MPCs. So basically what happens is that we have several, several uh, iterations of the MPC protocol. In each iteration, we have messages that P2 sends to P0, P2 sends to P1, P0 sends to P1, and P1 sends to P0. We hash all of them together for each, iter for each iteration. And, uh, and thus we get, uh, if we have K iterations, K hashes. And then we hash all of them together to get a, 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 a thing called a Merkle tree root, which are sent to verifier 1 and verifier 0. What verifier one and verifier zero do is they try to reconstruct this Merkle tree root. And the way they do it is by reconstructing different halves of the conversation. For example, uh, for one half of the iterations where we assume that P2 is following the protocol correctly, the prover sends the conversation between P2 and P1 and P0 and P1 and the verifier reconstructs the conversation from P0 to uh, P1. And similarly here, the verifier reconstructs the conversation from P0 to uh, P1. And the verifier gets the hash of the other half of the conversation, the other conversation which it did not uh, uh, reconstruct. Similarly, for the other half of the iterations, the the the, the prover simply sends the seeds that were used to uh, gen generate the messages, and the verifier uh, reconstruct these messages. Uh, and again, the verifier gets the hash of their messages which it did not regenerate. 
and thus if it is able to regenerate the root uh, of, of that fingerprint, it accepts the proof. So uh, finally, uh, uh, the, uh, the differences between Express and Sabre is that the proof time of Sabre is much lesser than the proof time of Express. However, the writing time of Sabre after the proof has been, after we know that it is there indeed valid DPF keys is greater than the write, writing time of Express. And the reason is that we have to use a much slower block cipher in order to enable this multi-party computation. So how do our results look like? Um, we see that the proof time is actually pretty low for, for us. Even if, even if our database size is around two to the 30, it takes just 0 0.64 seconds uh, to do the proof. And these are in the slowest settings uh, of, of, of Sabre. And uh, how many messages can we process per second? Uh, let's look at the comparisons. So with Repost, we have an almost Apple to Apple comparison, except that Repost is a three uh, server protocol. Ours is a two server uh, protocol. So we, we are at, at a slight disadvantage. Uh, but you note that as, as, as the number of leaves, that is the, num the database size bec becomes larger and larger, our performance becomes much, much better compared to Repost. Uh, and the reason is that as the database size becomes larger, the proof time becomes the critical factor. The experiments with, uh, with Express are slightly an Apple storages comparison, but the analytical, uh, uh, our analytical analysis shows that these are the results that we expect after our implementation is uh, complete also. Uh, again, we see the, a similar trend where uh, our performance becomes notably faster once, uh, 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 once, the, uh, once the number of leaves is, uh, is, is, uh, uh, is slightly larger. Uh, yeah, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Well, we had some pretty interesting presentations there. So thank you all of you guys for, uh, for those presentations. Uh, and we do have some questions that have been asked. So any questions that you think of in the meantime, just post them and we'll make sure to get to them there. Um, so we'll actually, we're gonna start out. Uh, Hardik, we're going to go, uh, we have some questions for you. Uh, so you can unmute yourself there and we'll get you a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. First one we have uh, is about the car models. And it was asking how recent are the car models that were used? Uh, would newer cars have less damage after collisions than older models? Uh, so to answer that, the models which were used in simulation were like Honda Accord uh, manufactured in 2008. And uh, for the real images too, the database pans out from 2004 to 2014 models. So we don't have the recent, uh, I would say, like the latest models 2000 after 2015. Uh, and yeah, obviously the impact of the prediction, uh, the prediction would be different for the latest models. Uh, so if we compare the predictions on Tesla, say, which is, uh, which has the high rating, safety ratings of five star, the prediction would be different on those kind of models. That makes sense. Uh, second question we have here uh, is, why does color impact the prediction? Uh, so we are using uh, basically image processing and the neural networks, which uh, learns the pixel values of the cars. So if we keep the color scale as uh, a BGR color scale, then it would uh, uh, learn the pixel values of the red car, the green car, blue car. So that's the reason we switch to the gray scale uh, model. Uh, so there are only two colors, black and white, and the pixel values is between only zero to one and not between zero to 55. Excellent stuff. And then we have another question. How do you account for the angle of impact? How would that affect the calculation for Delta V? Actually, that's a good question. Uh, we thought of it, uh, so uh, in the simulations uh, using rigs of rod, we actually created barricades. And uh, what we did is like we used the red Honda car to collide with the wall, the stationary wall. And uh, besides that wall, there were barricades. So we know like the car crashes at the same angle of impact because it cannot go or oh, like uh, besides the barricade. So the barricades restrict the angle of impact. That's what I mean. That but uh, that was for the sim. Sorry, that was for the simulation, uh, and for the real uh, crash images, we would be using uh, like normalization techniques, where we would have some kind of calibration markers to scale the images so that the angle of impact is pretty much balanced hmm. using those calibration markers. Perfect. Well, thank you very very much. No uh, 
now we have some questions for uh, H.M. Mahidi uh, on the his federated learning yep. approach. Uh, first question is uh, from someone who's new to machine learning, but they're very interested in it, is asking how you could elaborate about how the central server combines the data. And I know you had a little bit of, um, a little bit of that uh, in some of the slides. If you want to share your slides. Yeah, again, yeah. To you yeah I can. I want to share my screen if there's all right. Can I share my screen? You should be able to. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I believe. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, so the question is actually asked based on, I think, uh, distributed learning. So combining the data, uh, it happens in distributed learning uh, because since I'm working on fair learning, the data never comes to the central server. So to answer both questions, I'm going to answer both questions. So the first one is I will try to explain the, how I aggregate the models together then I'll go to the uh, distributed learning. So in terms of uh, models, uh, I'm going to make it full screen. So in terms of models, what I did, I did a layer wise model weights and biases averaging. So let's consider that I have four models. So this is the first neuron of each model. So I average them together and set this upper, uh, model weights and biases to this neuron here. So that goes for every uh, hidden layer neurons in each uh, uh, model updates, uh, updated model neurons. So that's how I did model, all model averaging uh, in terms of fair learning. However, in case of uh, distributed learning, uh, the, the combination of data based on the scenario. So if the data structure are same, since uh, I talked about uh, different university participating in, uh, you know, to do some uh, students uh, personalization. So in that case, the data set structure should be the same. So it can easily uh, add it together for the, uh, you know, to train the neural network model. So I hope that answer the questions. Uh, I think that covers it pretty well. Yeah. Uh, and then we have another question. Uh, what is the potential impact of having one client with data that's strongly biased or is very different from the data of the other clients? Uh, how would you handle that? Uh, in that case, I'd like to show you here. So in our research, we evenly distributed the data set to each client. So there is no biased data set. However, you can see that the impact of uh, the model performance uh, in case of uh, client four. So you can see the client poor performance increase, but at the last stage, uh, phase four, the client's performance decrease. However, it's still better than the initial ones, but this uh, deviation uh, of performance decrease is based on, I think, uh, the consideration of other models' uh, performance mm -hmm. or other models' uh, weights and biases, since we are aggregating all the models in the central server. So I think, yeah, it is, uh, it is uh, you know, visible that the models data and models performance of uh, each, each client uh, affects one another. So this is one of the challenges that we are working right now. So hopefully, yeah, uh, we'll do some contribution in the future. Phenomenal, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then we have uh, one last question uh, for Ad Aditya um, regarding the last presentation. Yeah, oh. and the question on that one, was you mentioned at one point that there was a probability of fraud uh, or uh, not of necessarily fraud but of, uh, of i guess fooling the system and that it was some probability based thing uh, would you mind talking a quick bit about how that scales or how how likely it actually is it for any uh, given system uh for any given system if we just do one iteration then there the, there is a uh, the uh, it is uh, i mean the probability of not cheating is just one over n but we do several several uh, simulations in parallel, so uh, then it becomes almost negligible. Uh, uh, it becomes uh, I don't recall at the top of my head, but I think uh, uh, it it is I think one uh, one over two to the one twenty eight or something like that. Uh, oh, after sure. we uh, after we um, uh, but yeah, these iterations are performed in parallel. Okay, so you're able to do them all in parallel in the same time frame, yeah. but it but that yeah. it reduces it to almost negligible there. Yeah. Excellent, uh, and that that fits um, quite perfectly into our time. Uh, so thank you very very much to our presenters, and thank you to everyone who asked questions there. Uh, and we will be having the poster session starting. We have a 15 minute break, and about and then after that, uh, the poster session will be on towns. Uh,
There we go. Okay, thank you. So, but